Love, love is, is the spirit of this church, church, and service is its calling. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. So today we're talking about anticipation. And anticipation can come in many different forms. And this morning, I invite us all to just come into this present moment and let go a little bit of all the anticipation you have for the day that is about to unfold. Let's all just take a nice breath together. Oh, I feel better already. Let's do that again. It's one thing to take a deep breath by ourselves but it's much more powerful when we breathe together. So this morning, as we come into this sacred space, I invite you to take in these words by David White called, Everything is Waiting for You. Your great mistake is to act the drama as if you were all alone as if life were a progressive and cunning crime with no witness to the tiny hidden transgressions. To feel abandoned is to deny the intimacy of your surroundings. Surely, even you at times have felt the grand array, the swelling presence and the chorus crowding out your own solo voice. You must note the way the soap dish enables you. <laughs> or the window latch grants you freedom. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentor of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and to invite you. And the tiny speaker in the phone is your dream ladder to divinity. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. <laughs> All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. Everything is waiting for you. For our, our chalice lighting, I have two quotes. The first one is from Khaled Hosseini. Of all, the, of all the hardship a person had to face, none was more punishing than the simple act of waiting. Now when I read that, I remember I recently came from Mexico City from visiting my family. And before going, I was thinking about the traffic in Mexico City with 22 million people. And, uh, that probably wasn't the focus. But of course, if I see it in a mo more positive way, uh, every time I get there with traffic or not, we are loved, my daughter and I, so it's always waiting for us. So I, you know, I must focus on that. And as a middle school math teacher, this time of the year is also a time of anticipation. And I can either focus on the kids who won't enjoy math, <laughs> no matter what I do, or the kids who come behind and I have to catch up as much as I can with them. Or I can focus on the excitement of learning and the excitement of learning the new names and the new personalities and the excitement of an entire new year uh, with new people. So thinking about that, I found the second quote. This is from the Winnie the Pooh book. Uh, 
Well, said Pooh, what I like best, and then he had to stop and think, because although eating honey was a very good thing to do, there was a moment just before you began to eat it, which was better than when you were, but he didn't know what it was called. <laughs> so I'm going to light this chalice uh, for all of us who are starting a new school year, either as teachers, as students, as parents, as children, so that we can flavor the joys of this new school year. What's next? That seems to summarize where we're at. What's next? What's next for our church? What's next for the world? What's next for the leaders of our country? All kinds of interesting, interesting things come up when we think about what's next. And anticipation, it, it's not positive or negative, isn't it? We can have, we can anticipate the worst. And we can anticipate the best, like Winnie the Pooh. So, a few week, a couple months ago, in early June, I flew out to be with my daughter for three weeks, and we were in such anticipation for this new baby to come. And she didn't come. And it looked like she was coming. My daughter was in labor, and then it stopped. And then it started again, and then it stopped the next day, and then it started again. Well, I was hoping to be with my new little grandbaby for two and a half weeks or so, but instead we were waiting for two and a half weeks. <laughs> and then I got to be with her, or we got to be with her for about three days. <laughs> So anyhow, it was an opportunity to show you baby pictures, of course. <laughs> but that anticipation was so intense. It wasn't just the excitement. It was, what if things don't go OK? What if there's a problem? What's it going to be like? Is my daughter going to be able to handle this? She was wondering, am I going to be able to handle this? And mom, you better be there. <laughs> Anyhow, it all worked out fine. But we have these two different notions of anticipation. Anticipation is nine-tenths of delight. That's so true. Think about what you might be anticipating right now. Maybe something wonderful. Maybe something for lunch. <laughs> And yet, oh yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't resist but throwing that picture in there. It's like the quintessential anticipation, isn't it? <laughs> and yet, Alfred Hitchcock reminds us that there is no terror in the bang, only in the anticipation of it. And if you think about it, fear comes from our anticipation. And fear is a great motivator. This says, thank goodness you're here. I can't accomplish anything unless I have a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Too often in my life, it's the fear that has motivated me rather than the love of something. <clears throat> So I'm a huge fan of Star Trek. Any other Trekkies out there? Yeah. <laughs> I figured. <clears throat> One of the things that I love about Star Trek, it's always wrestling with ethics and with their sense of what works and what doesn't and what can be right. But you know, there's always that sense of doing the right thing is the most important. And there's the sense of idealism. 
there's a sense that things are always getting better. And that 200 years from now, even though we'll go through rocky times, things will be even better than they are now. And it seems like, is it just my imagination? Maybe it is, but it seems like that whole perception of things constantly getting better has suddenly shifted. And now the general ethos seems to be being afraid of what's coming next. Is it just me? Is this happening to you too? I'm not just making this up, am I? You all experience this. Like, oh no. Do I dare turn on the news today? So we seem to have lost that trajectory of things always getting better. Instead of utopia, we've got dystopia. And we even celebrate dystopia. <clears throat> so there's an interesting, as I was pondering all of this, I came across some research that I've been a fan of for a long time. And that is how our brains become wired. So I would like to share with you um, a rather lengthy quote. This article, if you want a copy of the entire article, I have extra copies. And this came, it doesn't say who actually wrote the article, but it comes from um, the Pikes Peak Suicide Prevention Center. Um, so this is something that they talk about in terms of suicide prevention. So the article says, why do people complain? Not to torture others with their negativity, surely. When most of us indulge in a bit of moan, the idea is to vent. By getting our emotions out, we reason, we'll feel better. But science suggests that there are a few serious flaws with that reasoning. One, not only does expressing negativity tend to not make us feel any better, it's also catching, making listeners feel even worse. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you feel like you just got slimed <laughs> from all their complaining? <clears throat> yeah. So Steve Parton, an author and student of human nature, explains that complaining can literally kill you. He says, throughout your brain, there is a collection of synapses separated by empty space called the synaptic cleft. Whenever you have a thought, one synapsis shoots a chemical across the cleft of another synapsis, thus building a bridge over which an electrical signal can cross, carrying along its charge the relevant form of information that you're thinking about. Did you know you were doing that? But here's the kicker. Every time this electrical charge is triggered, the synapses grow closer and closer together in order to decrease the distance the electrical charge has to cross. The brain is rewiring its own circuitry, physically changing itself to make it easier and more likely that the proper synapses will share the chemical link and thus spark together in essence, making it easier for the thought to trigger habitual thinking. Not only do repeated negative thoughts make it easier to think yet more negative thoughts, they also make it more likely that negative thoughts will occur to you just randomly walking down the street. I'm interrupting myself for a moment. I experienced this. Do you? I, it, oh, how did I manage to wire my brain this way? But I know that I have, and I know that most of us have, actually. He goes on to explain, through repetition of thought, you've brought the pair of synapses that represent your negative proclivities closer and closer together, and when the moment arises for you to form a thought, the thought that wins out is the one that has less distance to travel the one that will create a bridge between synapses the fastest. Gloom outraces, 
positivity. Not only does hanging out with your own negative thoughts rewire your brain for negativity, hanging out with negative people does much the same. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, duh, I know that, but it, the research is fascinating, I think. Our brain tries out that same emotion that someone is describing or feeling. We try it out to imagine what the other person is going through. And it does this by attempting to fire the same synapses in your own brain so that you can relate to the emotion you're observing. This is basic empathy. It is how we get the mob mentality. It is our shared bliss at musical festivals. But it is also the night you at the bar with your friends that you spend who love, love, love to constantly complain. So the takeaway lesson is, if you want to strengthen your capacity for positivity and weaken your reflex for gloom, Surround yourself with happy people who, are re who rewire your brain towards love. So what does that have to do with anticipation? And what's next? Everything. Everything. What we anticipate tends to be what we create. So if we change what we are anticipating, we not only change the wiring in our brain and change the people around us, we change the world, especially if we do it together. So I don't know if this is happening for you, but I suspect it might be. Observing our culture right now, can we see the reverse happening? Mm -hmm. There's a cycle, there's, a, there's this, this spiral of negativity that just keeps getting worse and more intense. And we, I, I think we can see how the media plays into this and of course, our politicians play into this, do they not? Fear sells, but hope saves. So we have this fear that is just getting more and more intense and our brains are in our culture, I'm talking all of us in our entire culture, are getting rewired and rewired towards fear, towards reactivity, towards polarization. So how do we as Unitarian Universalists reconcile that reality with wanting to create a positive spiral that takes us up, that is idealistic? There is nothing wrong with idealism <coughs> that takes us into a better future. That's who we have always been as Unitarian Universalists. In a couple of months, there's a movie about to come out about a Unitarian minister named Waitstill Sharp and his wife, Martha, who were asked in 1939 to go to Europe to start smuggling out Jewish people and other people in danger of being killed by the Nazis. They smuggled thousands of people. Now, where do you think their anticipation lied? Of course, they had to be afraid. But did they think it was a hopeless endeavor? They wouldn't have gone. I talk to so many new folks that walk in our doors and so many of us that have been around for a while and there's this increasing sense of urgency and even desperation that 
We have got to do something. We have got to do something about racial inequality. We have got to do something about homelessness. We have got to do something about the hatred in the world that is causing so many shootings, whether someone is mentally ill or not. We have got to do something about climate change. I don't know. I think I just sensed that the anxiety in the room just went up. <laughs> All of these things have got to start with the belief that we can do something and that we need one another. Not only do we need to reprogram our brains, but we need to be among other people who are doing the same and who are dedicated to doing the same reprogramming of our brains. So we need our friends. And as Unitarian Universalists, I hope that is why we come here. Now, I have an issue when we say we're all like-minded. We're not. And Yahoo! I'm glad we're not like-minded. That's wonderful. But we can be like-hearted. We can all use our own belief systems to support us in making a difference and in being grounded in hope. And we do that much, much more powerfully together. We amplify our own efforts exponentially as we come together. And we are not just together in this congregation, but in thousands of other Unitarian Universalist congregations over, all over the world. And it's not just us Unitarians that have the potential for being positive, you know. <laughs> there are many other churches, faith traditions, that are feeling just like we are today, and that want to make a positive difference, and are tired of the polarizations, tired of the hatred, tired of the inequalities and injustice, the mistreatment of each other. We have to find them and work together and build coalitions to move that positive spiral up again and to be countercultural enough to shift the culture. So, let's be friends, shall we? I invite us now, as we ponder these things, into a spirit of prayer and meditation. Each and every one of us is the spirit of life. Each and every one of us is the spirit of love. And when we come together, we create something amazing, something truly sacred and beautiful. When we bring our best selves, this is holy, our community. May we share from our hearts, now and always. Amen. So what's next for us? What's next for us here at High Plains? Anticipation is just our brain imagining what's possible. So will we be grounded in fear or will we be grounded in new possibility? If we indulge our fear, we just rewire our synapses, right? So how can we let our fear go and work on that new possibility? As I've explained before, 
We are facing a challenging time here at High Plains. This year is the year that we must find our way into a sustainable situation. Will that be here in this building, on this property? Nobody knows. We don't know yet. Will we be on our own, or are we going to collaborate with Vista Grande Community Church to share a space? Not merge, just share a space? We don't know. Will we create an interfaith center that brings three or more faith traditions together to become a powerful force of positive change in the Colorado Springs region? We don't know. It's hard to know what to anticipate, other than this is our year to figure it out. Today, our board has offered to meet with you to discuss the golf course. In case you didn't know we have a golf course, we actually have two <laughs> miniature golf courses behind our property, or behind our building out here. And I encourage you to go take a look. Watch your step, be careful. Don't step over, or don't trip on those piles of rubble that we still need to get up. But we should be familiar with this, what this whole property is like. So the board has invited you to come and talk about this after church today, to give them your input, to share what ideas you have. The golf course, this is our second summer of not opening the golf course in order to save money. We realized a few years ago that we were losing money. If we continue to work on shutting the golf course down, we will save even more money and create a more, a, a safer situation. So, whatever thoughts you have about that, please join the board members after the service today to share your thoughts so that they have an idea of how to best move ahead. So, I wonder, if our mission is to transform lives through nurturing and inspiring each other and taking positive actions together in the world, how can that space that we now call the golf course help us live into that mission? That's the big question we get to live with. How can we use that space to further the mission of this church? So, throughout this year, get engaged. Be ready to be a part of the conversation. Because it's not just a few leaders making this decision. It's our entire congregation needs to be a part of figuring out how we move forward. As I mentioned, we have that sense of urgency. And yes, we have that sense of urgency about this facility as well. But as President Franklin Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And now we understand the neurological connections of why that's true. We must be fierce in our belief and anticipation of new possibilities. What new possibilities await us? What do we want to create? But that anticipation would just be another empty illusion unless we take action to make it happen. Resist the complaining and the cynicism that bring us down and play into the hands of depression and instead build that positive spiral that amplifies exponentially when we come together. I was talking with Robert Latham, a consultant from the UUA, a few days ago about you. <laughs> and he said something that I too thought from the very first days I arrived here. He said, I have watched them, meaning you, since their very beginning and have always felt that High Plains Church has a great potential but has been living on the edge of that potential over its history. This is true, my friends. This is true. 
There is so much more that we can do if we step into it. This church is full of amazing potential and getting more so all the time. But it won't happen if you're not a part of it. So not only is this year for us how we make our way into a sustainable situation, it is our year to live fully into that potential that each and every one of us brings together. So let's rewire our brains, shall we? I'm ready to rewire my brain along with you. And let's rewire the planet while we're at it. Clarissa Pinkola Estes says, when a great ship is in its harbor and moored, it is safe and there can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are for. We are a great ship. We have to figure out where and how we're going to set sail and venture out into those challenging and difficult waters where we truly do make a difference. <laughs> Now is the time to launch this ship with our fierce and courageous love. For love overcomes everything when, is that, when it is that courageous love, it trumps that fear. So my friends, I still believe in some version of utopia. Do you? Let's make it so. So, here we are, holding the hands of our potential. <laughs> holding the hands that hold our hearts in a sacred sanctuary. We have something amazing here. And the world needs what we have. May we carry it forward with every step, with every breath. May we live from our hearts, knowing that we are holding the hands of people who are doing just the same. Rewiring our future. May it be so. Amen. Please join with me in saying our closing affirmation. Nurtured by this community, inspired by all that we share, may our actions carry this love forward into our lives and into the world every day.